All right, well, we're going to be in Exodus uh, chapter 10 this morning, and we're going to go through the first, well, well we're going to read through the first 20 verses. Uh, we, won't, we won't get through all of it, but that's all right. Um, we'll read through it, and then there are some points that I think are really beautiful. This, what I have up on the screen is really what the, what these scriptures are all about. It's the plague number eight, and it's about the locusts. Doesn't that look nasty? Can you imagine being that guy that's in the middle of all of that? That's just a, you know, that's a, that's one I just pulled up off the internet. I mean, locusts are interesting. Have you ever seen the close-up of a grasshopper's face? Oh, man, it's crazy. Or how about an ant? I mean, insects are, they're, they're pretty wild. Um, if they were any bigger, they would be super fearful. We'd have to be, I mean, fearsome. They would, we would have to be really fearful of what they could do. So anyway, that's uh, what we're going to talk about this morning. And um, the title of the message this morning is that I may show that you may know. And really this message is about the, God's testimony and how we are a part of God's testimony in this life that we are living. And so um, let's just open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we're just really thankful for this morning that we have, because it's not just duty that we come to this place, but it really, and I pray for us that it's out of faith that we come, because we believe that you are God, that you are above all things, and that you have something in store for us this morning. Lord, we bring you what we have, which is not really much. It's a life that is... Man, it's a life that's broken. That's uh, um, we all have different circumstances and different things in our lives, and it's just amazing. You um, love us, that you care for us, and so, Lord, we want to come with really soft hearts before you to know your goodness and your grace this morning, not just out of a religious thing that we do. And I just, I just thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, you don't throw us away or you throw the towel in on us, but Lord, you you give us opportunity to soften our heart and repent before you and to come to you, and we thank you for that. Lord, may you teach us your way. Lord, may we hear the voice of your Spirit because you're speaking this morning in all of our lives, and that's the amazing thing, that we all are in different circumstances. We have different things going on. We have a life that you've blessed us with, and yet... Lord, you see everything in the midst of all of it, and Lord, you're directing and guiding, and you've given us your spirit that we don't have to be alone, but we're filled with your spirit, and we thank you for that. You haven't left us as orphans. Praise you, Jesus. So Lord, we want to spread the testimony of God through the way that we live, through the way that we talk, through the families that you've blessed us with, and through the occupation or the way that we move about in this world, Lord, we just pray that your testimony would be displayed through your body. And, you know, I'm not just talking about what we have here, but through the body of Christ as a whole. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, would you open up to Exodus uh, chapter 10 as we read down through this? And I'm just going to read down through these 20 verses. And I realized first service that my eyes are going bad. So <laughs> it's hard to read, man. I'm getting to that point where, wow, weird. Anyway, I have progressive lenses, but they're not doing the job. I need to go in and get them fixed. Verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son, the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs, which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron came in to Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me or else if you refuse to let my people go, before tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. And they shall cover the face of the earth, so that no one will be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of what is left, they, uh, which remains to you from the hail. And they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field.' 
They shall fill your houses, the houses of your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your father's father have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and he went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh. And he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Now, not so. <laughs> go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desired. And then they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, <clears throat> uh, as they. Not, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. And they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees, nor on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. I mean, this is an amazing story, right? I mean, this is eight of all the other plagues that we've already read about, uh, I just can't imagine being in this position and I can't imagine being a leader over, you know, this actual plague or this time period. Uh, you know, Pharaoh is in the midst of a very difficult and a trying time. Um, you know, we have a blessing to be able to look back on this and really see this for what it is. And we can come up with all of our ideas, but can you imagine being in the middle of that? in the middle of what God is doing in the, in the midst of Egypt. I mean, it really is amazing. This has been chaos for this nation. And so um, we see here that God gives us a real purpose. If you look there in verse 1, it says, God says that I may show these signs of mine before him. You know, he wanted to be able to show the signs. And then it says in the last part of verse 2, it says that you may know that I am the Lord. In a nutshell, God is saying, this is my testimony. We talk about our testimonies, right? And we talk about how we need to share our testimony. We need to share about that. But you know what? The reality is the testimony that we have, it's nothing apart from the testimony of God, isn't it? We're sharing, actually, we, we make it all about ourselves, and we make it about the things that we have done or the things that we've said or the things about our life, but it really is about what God has done. It's about how he has done great things in our life, that he's freed us. 
I mean, we all have a testimony of how God has worked, how he's drawn us into relationship with him. And so right here in these verses, God is, is, is concerned. He's, he's talking. This is all about my testimony. And you know, the reality is, this is why we're on the, the earth, to demonstrate <laughs> what God can do, what he has done in a relatable way to the people that are around us. Just in the same way, God intervened in this situation to show Pharaoh, the Egyptians, and the Jews what he could actually do. Not only that, but it echoes throughout all of human history. This is just one event where God has done amazing, mighty things. And this may be, I mean, this is one of those, uh, you know, those central places in the Bible where we see this, this uh, supernatural testimony of God in the natural world around us. And so God has given this and he has given it to us. We can look back on it and we can use this in a lot of different ways in our own life. We can talk about it. We can point to it. But we can also in our own lives, we can look at it and we can say, wow, if God did that back then, he's the same God. Yesterday, today, and forever, he can do those kinds of things even now. And I think, you know, as I was, as I read over um, this passage of scripture, and as I look through these chapters and I see the plagues, I mean, it's really easy to get focused in on, right? It's really easy to get focused in on, for I have what God says here, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants. Isn't that an easy thing to just really make this all about? And we do that and we question, well, how in the world can God do that? How can he harden man's heart? Why would he do that? You know, and we, and so we struggle with this big theological question and we miss the whole point of all of this, that this is about the testimony of God. Now, that's a, that, that's something that we need to understand and we need to have some, you know, way to talk about that, the sovereignty of God, the free will of man, and that all. And I and I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to check out and see what Jeff said about that, because he focused a lot on that, and it was really a good layout of how that intertwines together. Uh, be, basically, they work together in a beautiful way of establishing God's testimony, and that's what we see here, God's testimony in so many ways. I want to I share with you several verses that talk about God's testimony from um different parts of the Bible, and especially the New Testament. It says, 1 Corinthians 2, 1. This is one that I was reading um, this week and just meditating on because I was going to stand up before you guys, and I want this to be true. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. See, that was what Paul's life was all about. It was about the testimony of God. He gave himself to declare that in every situation. And I'm really blessed and thankful, and you are too, we all are, that we have, you know, the book of Acts that shows us, we have the letters that he wrote that show us how this isn't just, you know, this isn't just words on a page, but we can see that 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 was Paul's heart. It was about the testimony of God. He, He was, everywhere he went, he was declaring the testimony of God. Here's another verse that talks about the testimony of God. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I mean, this is a really great encouragement for us. We should be walking out and living out that testimony of the Lord before the world. We are not to be ashamed of the testimony of God. It's got purpose for us. It's, it's God's purpose for our lives. Um, sometimes I'm spinning the wheels wondering why in the world I'm working at the place I'm working. You know, I'm wondering what is the purpose in all of this? Well, let's, let, I need to come back. We need to come back to that place. Well, how can I, de- how can I use this to declare the testimony of God to the people? How can I declare that to the people that have hard hearts? As we're going to see Pharaoh definitely, and we've seen throughout this, that Pharaoh has a very hard heart, and the the Egyptians definitely have that hardness of heart. And here we go. This, This becomes really what is the culmination of the testimony of God. This is the culmination. First John tells us that, and this is the testimony of God that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son of life 
He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. See, that is, this is the testimony. Uh, Some versions may say the mystery of God. This is the testimony of God, that God has given us eternal life. This is the exclamation point that goes throughout all of eternity. All the things that we see within the Old Testament and the New Testament, it all hinges on this, the purpose of the testimony of God or the mystery of God. It's Jesus Christ and him giving eternal life. That's God's purpose all the way through, that man would have a way to experience eternal life. I mean, that is amazing. And we need to allow, I need to allow that to hit my heart in new and fresh ways. Because that's what is really the purpose of life. That's what we're we're walking out. We should be walking out that, the possibility and the hope of eternal life. I mean, especially in this world, right? I mean, look at all the things that are going on in our world around us. I mean, things just kind of crumbling, falling apart. Morality, there's hardly any shred of morality anymore. I mean, God wants us to remember the hope that we have in Jesus, and it's in his son, Jesus Christ. And so we see here that the testimony of God, the center point, is Jesus. And this is the amazing thing about that. You know, the Lord didn't, God just didn't write it in words and with, um, you know, men and women of old and, uh, you know, people's lives just talking and teaching about it or prophesying about it. That's what Hebrews 1 tells us. This is one of the, the my favorite scriptures about Jesus and the centrality of who Jesus is. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. I mean, Moses would be considered that. The story that we're looking at this morning, you know, that, that the plagues and all that God did, you know, Moses is standing there and he's, he's, he's proclaiming the testimony of God. He's claiming and proclaiming what God can do, that God is real, that God is among mankind. He was proclaiming that. But in the last days, God has spoken to us by his, by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I just love this, these verses, because, I I mean, think about it. God just didn't teach about it or talk about it, but he demonstrated it through himself as he, I mean, the incarnation is amazing, isn't it? Through himself, he demonstrated his character, his nature. Look at what it says there in Hebrews. It says that he is the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. What is the testimony of God? Well, it's the testimony of Jesus through the Gospels. We see it lived out in real human ways, which I think is amazing, and I'm so thankful for that. That's why, you know, the Gospels are so important to us because that testimony of God was poured out through Jesus in the likeness of man and the humility of God coming out through that. And that is an amazing picture for us. And we should really, I mean, when we're wondering, how in the world do it, what do I do in this circumstance, this situation? Obviously, you know, through the years, there's been what would Jesus do? But that is really a great, that's a great thing to think about. Well, what would Jesus do in this situation? How many times, when have you stopped and really thought about that in a hard situation? Well, I wonder, how, how would Jesus have responded to this? We see in Scripture how he responded to people. And, that, and it's not just Jesus' is in humanness, but it's Jesus in his godness, his expression of who God is and what God's heart is. 
And that is the amazing thing about what we have there. It is a beautiful gift and it should sow beautiful fruit in our lives and create beautiful fruit in our lives. This is, um, you know, in Revelation, this about the testimony of Jesus. Look at what this says. It says uh, in Revelation 19.10, it says, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. At the end of Scripture, we at the end of the Bible, you know, the last book that's given, here we have, here we have a really amazing description of what prophecy really is. See, prophecy and the things, and, and, and we can take this back. You know, Moses, at um, all, the, all the things that he says, you know, he shows up before Pharaoh, God tells him what to do. He, he actually uh, tells them what is going to happen the next day. There's gonna, it's prophecy. He's prophesying the future. In that prophecy, we can see this verse come to life. It is the testimony of Jesus. See, Jesus' testimony, he is the point. And he is the central place of God's testimony. Everything points to him. Everything falls into, you know, the world says, you know, and we say, oftentimes we say, oh man, the world is just falling apart. No, the reality is the world is falling together into his plan. It's falling together just how he has said. And we need to get excited about that. You know, obviously there is the fact that people are in, um, you know, hardness of heart and all of those things, and we need to pray, and we need, that's why the testimony of Jesus needs to be so important in our lives. But really, when we look at prophecy, the breath or the life of prophecy is the, is the testimony of Jesus. It's all about Jesus, Every, all of it, all of the prophecy. And so we can look, these plagues, all of this that's going on, the, we could see you know, God is calling them into the promised land. The Jews didn't know what that was, yet it's prophesied that they're going to go and they're going to do these things and they're going to have a place flowing with milk and honey. All of that, it's all about Jesus. It's all about deliverance. It's a picture of what Jesus ultimately is going to do and what God is going to do down through the ages. And so it is a it, it is a beautiful thing when we see that and when we understand that God is working towards that that revelation in everybody's heart, in everybody's life. The next verses we want to look at are down in verse 7. Um, you know, it says there that the Pharaoh's servants and uh, then Pharaoh's servants said to him, oh, actually, <laughs> we want to talk about um, um, verse 3, actually. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. See, this is the heart. So we have the testimony of, G of God and um, that that is so important to this whole situation. But also we see the state of Pharaoh's heart. And I don't know, as we've been going through this and as you've read before, I mean, isn't it amazing how hard Pharaoh's heart is after all of these things? He doesn't want to let go. He doesn't want to give up. He wants to hold on to what he has. And I suppose, you know, we have to, you know, come out of just looking at it in a spiritual way, but in a physical way. I mean, why is Pharaoh holding on to all this? I mean, why do you think? Why do you think he's holding on to all this? I mean, really, I mean, we should look at the scripture and say, well, what, what is he holding on to? Well, I mean, if you look at Egyptian uh, culture and all, you know, we can kind of look back on that and we can see, well, Pharaoh was thought of as a deity. He was thought of as God. I mean, that's a lot to let go, I guess. I mean, when everybody's looking at you and God as God and you kind of assume that kind of position over everybody's life. I mean, I think of the things that I have and where I have control. It's hard to let go of things like that. You know, when we have control or we have um, you know, issues. I, I, I feel like that was really a hard thing for me when my kids started to move into those years of having their own opinions, having their own thoughts. You know, it's hard to let go and treat them in a different way because I'm holding on to the things that I want or the things that I think should be there. And I, I, 
The same is true with Pharaoh. He's holding on to that. I mean, you think about the nation. The, the economy of the nation was built upon slavery and the, Jew, and the Jews being that. I mean, where is he going to pick up the loss there? You know, so there's all these things. I, I have to bring myself to that point because, you know, in my mind, a lot of times common sense rules. And I find myself stuck in a place just like Pharaoh's at. I want to keep this. I want to hold on to this. I want this to be manifest. I want the end to be this. And so I hold on to it and I don't trust the Lord as he has said to me in his word or, you know, in revelation or my prayer time or whatever, as the spirit of God is moving in my life. But I hold on to these things and I'm not willing to let go and let the Lord do the things he has. I mean, look at this. This is, this, is, this is Pharaoh's journey. This is what he was on. I mean, the first plague, water to blood. And this is what Exodus says about that. Pharaoh's heart is hard. In verse 22 of 7, Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Uh, 7.23, neither was his heart moved by this. The second plague was frogs all over the place, right? In your house. I mean, can, can you imagine that? In verse 18, or 8, 15, it says, He hardened his heart and did not heed them just as the Lord said. Third plague, lice. How nasty would that be? <laughs> wow. Uh, but Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said. Plague number four, flies. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. The fifth plague, livestock were diseased and died, but the heart of Pharaoh became hard. Plague six, boils. And at this point, I was going to put up, I was going to put up little pictures of all of this, you know, to pop on the scene. But I'm like, just to drive the point home, right, about this. Um, but at this one, boils, I just really didn't want to subject you guys to that. That might be kind of gross. So, um, seventh plague, um, hail. And this is what he did. He hardened his heart. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. He had hardened his heart and he lived in that place of the hardness of the heart. And I don't know about you guys, but that, I mean, that's an issue for all of us. It's not just an issue for unbelievers. It's not just an issue for somebody like Pharaoh who is being confronted by the awesomeness of God, but we are all in that position where we are confronted by God's amazing awesomeness and his ability to provide, to, to do things that are according to his will, that bring fruit, that isn't just physical or what we think we need, but it actually becomes eternal when we walk out on that. And that is amazing about what God can do. And that's what he wants to do when we soften our heart. Okay, so this is, uh, so what about repentance? I mean, we saw that the last week. Jeff talked about that. You know, Pharaoh kind of comes and he, he kind of he repents and he says, I'm sorry, forgive me. <laughs> you know, entreat the Lord for me. But look at, this is what godly sorrow does. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. And it's not like the world's worlds. Not to be regretted, but sorrow from the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all these things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. See, godly sorrow produces something. It doesn't just produce tears or words. It produces action. And it is, it's something that happens over a period of time, often, you know, where we're able to walk this out. See, Pharaoh goes right back to what he was doing before. He goes back to saying, no, you can't go. He says you can go, prays for forgiveness, you know, entreat, has, has Moses entreat the Lord for him. I mean, what is that? That's not true repentance. What true repentance is, is falling on your face, admitting your responsibility, saying, I thought I was God, but I'm not, <laughs> you know? forgive me, that's what, and, and recognizing 
what God has already said. See, that's what true repentance is. And then it produces fruit and action in our lives. Uh, you know, I don't know, in your own life. I mean, probably we have all done it. We say, forgive me for this. And then we kind of just go on in the same thing. Or, or, you know, everything's okay for a while. And then the same thing repeats itself over and over again. You know, and then we do it again and again. You know, it's hard, isn't it, when we're dealing with people? When we're dealing with a will or a hardness of heart, it's really difficult to understand. We need to be able to see that process and the fruit of repentance because there are fruits there. There is a diligence that it produces of clearing yourself. It's repentance leading to salvation, not only regretted, but the sorrow, um, whoops, went the wrong way, Um, indignation or anger over that. You know, fear, I mean, there is that that comes in. Oh my gosh. God is big. He's awesome. The fear of the Lord produces wisdom in our hearts. It produces repentance when we understand who God really is. There's zeal that happens. And then that we prove that ourselves to be clear in that matter by the actions and the words that come out of our lives. Um, this is another interesting verse that talks about repentance. And it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it says, In humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I mean, that is amazing that, that it is. Repentance is something that God will grant to us as we seek him as we look to him, as we agree with him, right? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We can be forgiven. We can have repentance. God grants that to us, and it's through Jesus. It's through his sacrifice on the cross, and that is a beautiful thing. We don't see that with Pharaoh. It's not true repentance. It is like Esau's. Look at what Esau's repentance was. Hebrews 12, 16 through 17 talks about that. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now, this is, this is the interesting thing about that. Esau falls into that same kind of category that we struggle with, right? Because the Bible says what the Lord says. Not just, I mean, it's just not written there, but it's God's word that says, um, es- so there is Jacob, who I loved, right? And Esau, who I hated, I mean, that, that, that comes into that whole argument of, man, how can God do that? How did God hate this guy? How, what in the world is going on there? But the re- reality is that God knew his heart, and this verse clarifies to us what Esau's heart really was. He sought. He sought the blessing. He was looking for the blessing of God. And we know that from the passage. He went back to his dad, and he said, Oh, don't you have another blessing for me? Can't I have a blessing? I want the blessing. I gave it away. You know, with tears, he's crying about it and he wants the blessing. And his dad says, no, there's no more blessing left. I gave it back to you. I gave it out. It's gone. His heart was looking for the blessing. He wasn't on his knees before God. He wasn't on his knees asking for repentance or forgiveness that he had actually made a mistake. It was just, he was looking for some blessing. And that's the way that we can be in our lives and our, in our hearts at times. We're looking for God's working. We want him to do these things. And yet we have the hardness of heart that's not really seeing and realizing the position that we are in and the things that we have done. That responsibility for our life needs to be taken. The responsibility of agreeing with God that this is an issue. This is something that needs to be dealt with in my life, and I'm willing to do that and soften my heart in that. Um, so uh, that hardness of heart is probably, and the hardness of heart that grows in man's heart is probably not, you know, uh, defined more clearly, I think, than in the book of Romans, as we see that slide of man's heart into what he wants, what he thinks, what he is going after. 
And so this is what Romans 1.20 says. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. See, in this, uh, Pharaoh, he didn't, he, he, he didn't attribute the things that he was seeing. The, the general, we call that the general revelation of God. It's all around us, the general revelation. Creation screams out the testimony of God through what God has created, how it is so intricate and it reacts with things so amazingly and it's all connected together. There's a creator behind all that and what the Egyptians did, they just, you know, started to name off gods and make gods for all of these different things that they thought were uh, devastating, that were uh, amazing, that they couldn't explain. They all just became gods. They were very polytheistic. They attributed, and so Pharaoh attributed all of the things of nature, all the things that God said, all of that general revelation, he he attributed to man and to man's ideas and man's thinking, not seeing the eternal power of God within that. And because of that general revelation, that's one thing that will be condemnation in the end of time not attributing those amazing, wonderful things to the Lord, not attributing them to God. So we see that slide of that heart in um, Romans. These are verses in Romans 1. And I would encourage you guys, if you're interested in that, because it's really great to read through Romans 1 and just pray and to see. You know, then you can see, you know, some of the dif- difficulties that we face in our culture and in our society right now. It's because this is the the devolution of our society in Romans 1. Look at what it says here. In 24, God gave them up. In 26, it says God gave them up. In 28, it says God gave them over. And this is the mechanism in verse 18 of chapter 1. This is the mechanism that makes that, 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 that really, I don't know how to say it, how, how, it makes God respond as, as man does these things and wills these things and wants these things because they are they have in their heart, um, verse 18, they suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. Pressing down, pushing, it's an active word. Pressing down, pushing. The things that would pop up in their life that would display who God is, the thoughts that come into the mind, they suppress it and push it down. Think about that in your own life. Think about it in your own life. How do you suppress the truth of God? Because we do as Christians as well. I, you know, we're not perfect, are we? I can give you lots of examples from my life where I have suppressed God's truth. When he has been saying something to me through his word, through the revelation of his spirit, and yet I have what? leaned on my own understanding or I've justified out of it because I think that I have a better way or I just have this common sense and I'm like going to go with common sense. I haven't even given the Lord a chance to actually do or prove what he says because I've suppressed his truth. I've actively said, no, I want to do this. I'm so thankful for the word of God because it's living and powerful and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It allows us. The spirit of God takes the word of God, makes it come alive in our hearts and our lives so that it's just not a bunch of rules and regulations or words written on a page, but it is life. And that's what the word of God does as we give it place in our hearts and our lives. And it helps us to not suppress the truth, but it opens up the truth of God to us, that we can walk in that truth. Um, Because the reality is we can't serve two masters. They were called to serve the Lord. They were going to go out of Egypt and they were going to serve the Lord. Um, That's what, that's what um, God wanted. And that's what God wants from us, that we would also have that same heart to serve the Lord. No servant, this is what uh, Jesus says in um, Luke 16, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that's exactly where the nation of Israel was. You know, they were in a place where they were serving, they were slaves, 
And in reality, they couldn't do the things that God wanted them to do. They couldn't sacrifice to him. That was, that was um, you know, an abomination to the Egyptians. You know, they, they, they were limited in so many ways and God wanted to free them out to serve the Lord. And the same thing is true with us. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to free us so that we can serve him and so that the, the life that we live becomes the testimony of God through something living that people can see that they can touch, that they can hear, and that they can know that God is real. This is what God says. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's Romans 12, 1 through 2. Uh, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God or that you can prove the testimony of God that he's been saying throughout the ages that you would be able to do that. And he, uh, he calls us to serve him, to worship him in spirit and in truth. And that should be the mode and the operation of our lives. So as we, um, as we look at this passage, um, I just want to jump down to, uh, verse seven. We're going to end with verse seven because, um, this is a point that, I think is really good for us. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? I mean, Pharaoh wasn't getting it, but his servants are getting it. They're saying, what are you doing? Why don't you let them go? Why are you hanging on to all of this? Don't you see that this is destroying this whole nation? I mean, (laughs) wow, all these demonstrations, but his heart continued to get hard and to get harder and harder and harder. That hardness of heart can be something that we have as well. And we need to be really careful of that because you know what? The Egyptians were found in, really, they, they, they talk about, it. they say, we're snared, we're trapped. They're trapped, and that's what that word means, snared, to be trapped. They're trapped between a rock and a hard place, right? The rock being the judgment of God and what God has said and the word of God too Pharaoh, let my people go, and yet they're trapped between that judgment and the reality of the hardness of their heart. They're just trapped in that spot, and that's the way we can get all men, all people, all women, we can get in that place where we are trapped between a rock and a hard place. We're trapped between what we know is right and the hardness of our heart. And so the question today that I just want to ask, and I want to ask myself that as this as well. You know, why don't I let go? Why not just let go in that situation? Why not let go of these things that are really going to just destroy relationship, destroy situation, destroy families? You know, why do I hold on to that? Why do I let that become something that is really important to me? Um, <clears throat> I just have an example of that that I want to share. Just yesterday... I was, um, you know, I was studying for this and, uh, you know, I came downstairs and um, Brenda was talking to me about going away for three, three days to go and visit her mom and dad, right? And many of you know them and she just really felt like she needs to go and we've talked about it before and I'm like, yeah, go, go, go. But then I said something like, oh, I, I don't even remember what I said. What did I say? I don't even remember what I said. I said something. I said something like, I don't like it when you go or something like that, Right. <laughs> I mean, it's three days, and it's three lonely days. I'm all by myself, right? So, um, you know, and I I said that just to let her, I don't know why I said it, okay? So then I go get my hair cut, right? I go get my hair cut, and I'm I'm getting my hair cut, and I don't really have much to cut off, and and I'm I'm doing that, and I say, yeah, I want to fade a two up the side, and um yeah what am i going to do with the top i have no idea what to do the top because there's not really is there a top you know that's what i'm thinking and um the lady looks at me says well why don't you just shave it all off and i'm like no 
And it made me think, well, why in the world, as I was driving home, I was thinking, why do I hold on to that? I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't have had to pay 20 bucks for this. I could just do it myself, right? It's a lot easier. But why am I holding on to that? Because I was in some way. I mean, I know that's something stupid, but, um, you know, and it's not really, it's very in, inconsequential. But why do I hold on to these things? So I get home and I walk into the house and Brenda's been crying and I could tell. And I asked her, I said, well, what's going on? And she didn't really want to tell me. And then we talked about it. And it was that I had said that I really don't, she don't feel like I want her to go and she wants to go. And so I'm like, oh my gosh. I, you know, and I knew at the time that I probably shouldn't say that because I know her. I love her. You know, and I know those things. I, I, I know how to push her buttons. I know how to manipulate or whatever. You know, we do that with people that we're really, that we know very well. But I had really hurt her by the hardness of my own heart. You know, I was concerned about myself, concerned, of, silly, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Three days, that's, I mean, I've gone for a long time. I've gone for three weeks on mission trips. You know, we need the Lord to give us discernment in those kinds of things because those are the things that become foundational in the way our heart is. Are we soft to what the Lord is saying? Are we ready to respond to God's will? Are we able to declare his testimony in any situation by the way that we're living, by the way that we're speaking, by the things that we do, the things that we're thinking? I mean, are, are we able to do that? And it comes back to those things that we think, oh, well, that's not really a big deal. It doesn't really matter if I think that. You know, because the other thing that I did in that situation is I started to justify, well, you know, I, I say that, that I don't want you to go because I love you so much, right? I end up, it just becomes a justification. I mean, I do. I mean, that's true. I do love her. But is that a justification for my selfishness and to bring a guilt trip on her? I mean, these things are tricky, aren't they? Think about your life. Think about the things that you hold on to. Think about what you don't want to let go. Think about how you talk about it. Think about what people see. Think about what your kids see. You know, how you deal with things. How you and your wife deal with things. You know, these things, the hardness of heart comes out in all kinds of different ways. We need to come to that place where we are willing to just let go so that that destruction that can come and that will come eventually in our hardness in some way in some form it's gonna come we have a whole we have a whole bible that that shows all kinds of paths how that has happened this particular time the destruction is like this i forgot to talk about this last service but did you know speaking of locusts and i wrote this with red pen on purple paper. Paper. How stupid was that? <laughs> I can't even see this. So anyway, a swarm of locusts the size of New York City. It eats in a day. Okay, so New York City is 302 square miles, just the city. Okay, so that's 302. Okay, these locusts, they covered the whole nation of Egypt. I don't know at the time what it, what it was. It was big. It was a big nation at the time, probably. I don't know. I didn't look that up. So, But I'm sure that it was bigger than 302 uh, square miles. Okay, they eat. They eat that amount of locusts in one day, eat the amount of food for people that live in the state of New York and the state of California. That's how much they eat in one day. They consume as much, I don't know how many, I should have looked that up too, um, how many people are in New York, the state of New York, and in California. That would have been good. You can look it up. I mean, that is amazing. I mean, talk about devastation and destruction. Wow. This plague was really, I mean, it was really bad. This was really bad because it destroyed everything that was left. I just can't believe that. Here's another, here's another thought on that, that uh, the Grand Valley is about 100 and, I mean, 30 miles down the Grand Valley by five miles. It's long and, you know, kind of uh, long and, and not very wide. Um, <clears throat> it's 150 square miles. 
So if you double the Grand Valley, that would be the size of New York City. So, I mean, I just can't even believe that. Locusts just in the Grand Valley here, twice the, Grand, the size of the Grand Valley, would eat that much. I just can't even imagine. That is just amazing. And the thing about locusts is it just doesn't, it just wasn't a problem. That, I mean, they ate all the crops, right, that they were going to store up, that they were going to live on. But if you, if, you, if you think about that in relationship to the destruction of sin, there's a lot of similarities. And I will leave that to you. Because all of these plagues, you can, you, can, you can think about them in terms of sin and what sin really does. I mean, I mean, the frogs, sin is slippery, slimy. It's hard to pin down sometimes, really hard to get to. You know, it, 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 it affects you in so many different ways. So you can go through all the plagues and you can look at that and just that they are like a manifestation even of what sin and the destruction that sin reeks, reaps on live so